Please note that the session is being recorded for the benefit of other students and colleagues who are unable to attend. The format for today's panel will include a brief inter introduction that I will give for each of our panelists, followed by their 15 minute talk. I will ask that you please wait until after the panelists have finished presenting before asking questions. And then we have some time scheduled for discussion and, and enrichment of, of what we've been hearing. Uh, if you are unable to uh, ask a question, perhaps we can try the chat function as well. So we'll try our best to, to uh, address everyone's questions. So this morning, we've brought together four distinguished colleagues from Rio de Janeiro who have dedicated their careers and lives to the betterment of health and life for Brazil's most underserved communities. I will introduce each colleague very soon, but first I wanted to talk a little bit about the inspiration for this panel. So ongoing systemic and ingrained racism against black persons in the United States and the resulting loss of black lives, suffering and inequity among black and other minority communities has reawakened a call to action in the United States and around the world. In this call, we acknowledge that racism is a global problem and knows no borders. Therefore, we must understand and denounce racism in all its forms. Today, we will have an opportunity to learn from our fellow Brazilian colleagues about racism, social exclusion, and the burden of substance use among Black Brazilians. The panel will help us understand racism in a Brazilian context and importantly, elevate our global awareness and discussion of concrete steps to eliminate the institutional, policy, and cultural rationales that perpetuate racism and inequities in health and life around the world. Our scholars and activists on today's panel are from Brazil's Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, also known as Fio Cruz, from the Getulio Vargas Foundation in Rio de, Jane uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and from the underserved community of Manguinhos in Northern Rio, Rio de Janeiro. Together, we will discuss the historical and present day context of racism against persons of African heritage in Brazil including the sociological construction of racism in Brazil and the resulting social exclusion and inequities. So it is my privilege to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is a phenomenal colleague and, and mentor for me. Uh, Dr. Francisco Ignacio Bastos is a senior researcher at the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation in, in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Dr. Bastos is a physician and former chair of, the grad of graduate studies in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Fiocruz. His research expertise is in substance misuse, particularly its association with HIV, viral hepatitis, and other sexually transmitted infections and bloodborne diseases. He has extensive expertise in both quantitative and qualitative research. And Dr. Bastos has been the principal investigator on a number of large multi-city studies on HIV and other bloodborne infections and sexually transmitted infections. His clinical and research experience in drug use and HIV AIDS have focused on disadvantaged minorities, particularly in the Brazilian context. Dr. Bastos will frame our panel today with a discussion of the historic context and concept of racism as in Brazil. We welcome Dr. Bastos and please give me a moment. I will share sp the screen so that I can okay. or Thank you very much. Uh, obrigado, gracias. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and um, please if you could uh, put the... Yes. I, yeah, yeah, okay. I will try to load the, the screen. Welcome everybody. And thank you, Cristal. Very good. 
Okay. Um, so this is a um, very simple and brief presentation uh, that I call race, use and misuse insights from biology and social science. Race is a very complicated concept, most of the time uh, used in the wrong way, but uh, despite the fact that uh, it has been misused so many times, all of you know the suffering, the problems, the wars that have been associated with the misuse of this concept. So I will begin with the biological dimension. So please, next, next slide. Oh, I should do this, no? Mari, um, can, can you the put the next earlier? one? Yeah, 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 yeah. One? next one, yes. This one? Uh, the next. Um, the second one. I think something's wrong because we are not seeing the full presentation now. We are oh. seeing your PowerPoint. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, maybe I will try again. Uh, this is the last one. Yeah, this is the second one. Yes, okay, thank you. Yes. So basically, from the point of view of biology, race is a um, comp complex concept. Uh, sometimes it's just an empty concept, but frequently is a misuse concept, uh, despite the social relevance that it may have in many different uh, societies. If, if you follow um, sound biology using, for instance, phylogenetic trees or paleogenomics or the study of the old uh, genomes of uh, ancient human beings or ancestor of Homo sapiens, you will see that uh, there is a very deep, deep discrepancy between wh what we usually call race, that is basically a pheno phenotypic um, concept, so basically how people look like, and the true basis of uh, the genetic makeup of people. Ancestry is a complex concept, is very dynamic, and it comprises the population genetic over thousands of years. And usually, uh, as will be discussed later by Lijani, ancestry has been misused also in terms of classification. For instance, uh, um, most people can remember that in Nazi German, uh, one person will be defined as Jew. Uh, in case one in eight of, of his or her ancestor was Jewish. And so uh, ancestry is much more complicated than just defining or uh, people by this very uh, simple, oversimplistic share. Uh, basically, nowadays uh, in America, I, I think most of you uh, are, were born in America or live in America, uh, should be actually called African-American since in terms of genetics, uh, Africa is the key cradle of all human beings we no longer accept the concept, uh, traditional concept called out of Africa. So human beings didn't leave Africa at the same time in the same period, but um, 
very frequent waves of people spread from Africa to other places. It's not the only source, but it's the main source of all humankind. Uh, as recently very clearly demonstrated by David Reich, I will show the book later on, uh, there are successive migrations, interbreeding, forced displacement, population bottlenecks, so the history of humankind is very complex and for, for many, many times people move from one place to other place and mix up with other populations, including uh, not only sapiens, but nowadays we know very well that also with Neanderthal man. Please, the next. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, basically the classic studies of uh, the ancestry of uh, human beings over the millennia were launched by a brilliant Italian uh, scholar who worked in Stanford for a long time, Luigi Cavalli Sforza, uh, a true genius because with very, very limited tools. He could map the movements, the inbreeding, the origins of people, profiting from a combination of what he called genes. So the available tools of genetics in, in, in that period. People or, or the study of the history of different populations and also language. So Cavalli's forces was basically both a geneticist and a linguist and combined the both, both dimensions. Now we have very powerful tools. Now we have access and the possibility to rebuild old genomes. And I recommend very strongly this book from David Reich. It's a recent book, very well written, very clear. And Reich basically uh, based his study on very in-depth analysis of genomes and phylogenetic trees over millennia. The next, please. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, um, the sound basis of biology and the sound basis of social science was strongly biased by uh, early misapplications of concepts uh, originally coined by Darwin, uh, by his cousin, Francis Galton, a brilliant statistician, but a man who promoted what uh, he coined the word eugenics. And he published in the end of the 19th century his book about uh, eugenics called Inquiries into Human Faculty and Its Development. Unfortunately, eugenics not only spread in many different places, but uh, was further distorted by several groups like the Nazi Germans, for instance, creating the fake concept of Aryan. Aryans are originally a population from India and the uh, Nazi swastika, the cross with the uh, uh, lines is the inverted uh, version of an Indian original uh, symbol, but actually Germans and other people from Eastern Europe ha have no direct link with the, these populations in India. But uh, unfortunately, despite the totally unsound link between the two things, uh, all of you know that such misguided concepts uh, promoted a major war 
and the death of more than 25 million people all over the world. This is a picture in the right is a Lebensborn or a birth house uh, just uh, dedicated to the so-called Aryan children. Children that do not exist from the point of view of biology, but anyway, promoted by the Nazi German. It is the next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, in Brazil, okay, no, 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 the previous one, please. Of course. Okay, now you have three pictures. Uh, in the left is a classic picture, but few people know that in no country in the whole world, black slavery was in place for so many years. It's the longest history in the whole world of black slavery. In the middle, you, you can see a uh, riot that in Portuguese is called Revolta da Chibata. It's, very, it's a little bit difficult to translate exactly, but basically is a riot, a revolt of uh, sailors in their m vast majority uh, black people against the officials. Uh, the vast majority of them white people from affluent uh, strata. And, and shibata is uh, a means uh, of beating people. And this riot was basically motivated by the fact that the sailors were beaten up by the officials on a regular basis as a disciplinary um, action of course illegal but uh, a daily practice unfortunately and in the right uh, picture you can see count Gobineau, a famous french uh, and the founding father of the white supremacy system which uh, still prevail in many places in the world including our both countries and it's very curious because he wrote a giant book, but when his book was translated from French into English, they cut 1,000 pages of the original book because the uh, original idea of Godinot is that the, uh, what he ranked as the worst case situation was the racially mixed population. And in the English edition, if you can assess it, it will say that uh, it's basically a uh, dichotomy between black and white. So uh, Gobineau inspired the American racist uh, scholars, but in a very biased way very different from his original work. These few people know. And also, um, few people know that when Gobineau's writings were translated into German, they call uh, this, this uh, uh, kind of thinking as Gobinism, and they included uh, prejudice against the Jews that were not included in the original uh, writings of Gobineau. So they create a third version of a wrong concept. So wrong concepts can be very, not only very dangerous, but can have a long, long life. And they are adapted by translators and editors to their own purpose. Next slide, please. In Brazil, um, we, we had a very strong tradition of racism and the, the idea that uh, Brazilians were a degenerate race. Uh, 
both due to the presence of uh, a large fraction of slaves and former slaves, and also uh, the First Nations or Indians in Brazil, the indigenous population of Brazil, and also uh, the very frequent, uh, very high proportion of people who are uh, of mul multiple races because they mix up over time. Gilberto Freire is one of the most important uh, sociologists and anthropologists. He studied in, in the US, in Colombia, at Colombia, with Franz Boas, and his work is a double sword uh, work because when he wrote uh, what in English is, is called The Master and the Slaves. Actually, the name in Portuguese is a little bit different. It's, it's a reference to the place that people stay, not the, to the people themselves, but uh, it's not clear for an English reader. So I think The Master and the Slaves is a, is a very good title in English. Um, he was a champion of the African contribution to, Bra to Brazil's culture. And this is very, very important because it's, it's the first time someone challenged the racist ideas prevailing for so many years. So just black labor in Brazil took place over 300 years. So it is very, very entrenched prejudice in uh, the Brazilian society and a major answer of uh, economic and social life. But Gilberto Freire uh, uh, make a made a bet that the progressive mixing of all fractions of population would create what he called a racial democracy. And this over time be be became a kind of, of myth in Brazil. So for for years, people believe that racism will not exist in Brazil because it's a so mixed society. So why to, to think about racism and uh, discrimination in a place where uh, everything is mixed and together? But uh, unfortunately, this is not true. The, I, I just copy and paste this text from an, an American author I don't know, uh, I never read before, Robin Sheriff, but uh, his book seems very, very interesting. Next slide, please. And then um, a second um, line of sociological inquiry uh, was launched in Brazil, basically in Sao Paulo. And the leader of this group was Florestan Fernandes, first in inspired by the French mission. Um, one of the leaders of this French mi mission was uh, Levi Strauss, one of the most famous anthropologists worldwide. And another was Roger Bastide. And Roger Bastide, and Florestan Fernandes, so one French and, and one Brazilian, they uh, carry out the first empirical studies and they realize that uh, besides all other kinds of inequality, like education, income, or other characteristics of social strata, racism was uh, very important uh, uh, dimension. It would be for, for, for me totally impossible and it's difficult to move back to understand people in the beginning of more than one century ago to understand their minds but for our contemporary minds it doesn't make sense that 300 years of slavery and then um, the one decree that just say that people were free, but the, 
didn't offer any kind of education, labor, or real in, uh, participation in society could just uh, out of the blue solve all the problems. So nowadays it seems very strange uh, that people uh, could believe in, in this uh, absolutely um, uh, strange equity uh, more than 100 years ago. But the fact is that uh, it, does, it does exist and it did exist. And just to, f to finalize, uh, in the 60s, Florestan Fernandes published the first book you can see in the right side of your screen called uh, The Meaning of the Black Protest. It's the first book. Uh, it was written 60 years before the current day, but it anticipates many things you are observing now for instance, in the US, uh, he, he discussed a lot of aspects uh, such as the violence by the police, the fact that the police was basically recruited from the affluent classes, the um, bias in terms of justice, et cetera, et cetera. But it was the first book uh, in Brazil to anticipate that this would be a kind of natural uh, phenomenon because everything is, was so unequal that people will not uh, remain uh, just observers for their whole lives. Sometimes uh, some disagreements, sometimes some conflict will, will take place. So uh, this is my short presentation. I'm totally open to questions and it was a great pleasure to talk with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bastos. Uh, this is uh, at, what we'll do, I think, is uh, in the interest of having the continuity, uh, we'll continue with, with our next presenter. Uh, and, and again, my appreciation for this, uh, well, Actually, let's see. We have a question, and I'd like to maybe honor that. Uh, Dr. Meacham, did you have? Oh, no question. Okay. I'm so glad you're here. So uh, let us go on, and thank you very much, Dr. Bastos. So at this time, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Ligiani Toledo. Dr. Toledo is an associate researcher at the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation um, and in Rio de Janeiro. Janeiro. Uh, she's an investigator in epidemiology of substance use and mental health. In the last four years, she's collaborated to develop studies about socially stigmatized populations, including persons who use drugs, especially crack cocaine, which is an enormous burden in Brazil. Uh, trans, she works with transgender women and in the prevention of substance use among children and teenagers. Dr. Toledo has worked as a research consultant with non-governmental organizations in Rio de Janeiro, where she has worked with a team of physicians, psychologists, and social workers from the unified healthcare system on harm reduction, which is reducing the harm uh, among individuals who use substances, uh, improving their lives, and a, developed a program of community outreach workers to promote the health and health equity of persons who use drugs in two different poor communities in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, the two communities are Mare and Manguinhos. Dr. Toledo, Toledo will discuss the use of race and color and variables in epidemiological studies in Brazil and the challenges of using race in epi epidemiological studies in a multi-ethnic country such as Brazil. Warm welcome to Dr. Toledo. Thank you, dear Marty. Uh, could you put my slides too? Yes, of course. Of course. I mean, my, my cell phone. Of course. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marty, Marie Luisa, to organize this panel for us. Okay, okay good. Very good. 
thank you for all for joining us this morning, this afternoon in Brazil. Uh, as Mari said, I will discuss some aspects of challenge, the employment of color, race, ethnicity, variable in epidemiological studies in Brazil. Next, Mari. First of all, why is it important to employ the color, race, ethnicity variable in epidemiological studies and in health information systems? Because color, race, ethnicity is one of social demographic variables used to measure social inequality. Color, race, and ethnicity are a particular dimension of social stratification, which defines differences in access to goods and service as well. And why so complex to use the color, race, ethnicity variable in epidemiological studies? Because the concept of race is based on a social construct. Race is a subjective concept based on social, political, cultural construct. As Chico said, uh, there is no objective measure about race as a biological or genetic marker. And such construction can differ from society to society, and it can also change according to region, context, life history, social status. Ethnicity as well is viewed as a construction with geographical, social, cultural, and religious meanings. Next two. So to, to begin our discussion, it is important to understand the differences in classification of race, ethnicity, <coughs> sorry, in Brazil and in the US. <coughs> Let's to begin with the differences. In Brazil, the race concept was a construction based on skin color as a phenotype. It is based on physical characteristics of individuals as skin color. On the other hand, in the US, the race concept was constructed based on continent of origin, ancestry, and not in the physical characteristics. Having said it, let's talk about the similarities. Both countries estimate the distribution of population according to color, race, ethnicity through census and national household surveys. Both countries also collected color, race, ethnicity data based on self-identification and closed end questions that basically is meaning when someone is interviewed on what is your race in census for example the subjects can respond as from the categories available in that question based on the perception about skin color and i told you before how people per se their skin color can change from region to region and social context. For example, depending on my social, social and cultural context, I journey, if I am in the north or northeast of Brazil, where the majority of population is black, maybe I can perceive myself as pardo or white. However, if I am in the south of Brazil, where the majority of population is white, maybe I can perceive myself as brown or black. Next, Mari. The Brazilian Institute, Institute of Geography and Statistics, <coughs> EBGE in Portuguese, uh, has used five categories to collect data of color, race, ethnicity in census. They are white, Pardo. Pardo is the category that classifies a mixed population to represent miscegenation. There is no translation to pardo from Portuguese to English because it is a native and poor. And the third category is black, yellow, Asian, indigenous. The present color race classification in Brazil census mix skin color with ethnicity ethnicity because the indigenous category. This classification is also used in several Brazilian information systems, although with a lot of completeness, and it is recommended to be employed in epidemiological studies. 
it's important to, to highlight that diverse people from different ethnicities as indigenous, Portuguese, black, come from various regions of the African continent, Spaniards, Jews, Germans, Italians, Arabs, and Japanese formed our country. So Brazil is known worldwide for the mixture of diverse ethnicity and it results in a very diverse population. Many scholars in Brazil have been discussed that the five categories is not enough, enough to represent the diversity of Brazilian population. Um, in the US, in the US, the, the Census Bureau has used six categories, <coughs> sorry, to collect data on <coughs> race and ethnicity. Those categories include racial and national origin or social groups. They are white, black, or African-American, America, India, and Alaska Native, Asian, Native Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islands, some other race. Here in the US, the concept of race ethnicity is separate from the concept of Hispanic origin. It is important to, to emphasize that the race classification in Brazil and in the US are not directly comparable. Some researchers have adopted the dichotomous categorization of white and no white in epidemiological studies in Brazil, including us. <laughs> but it is still problematic because you can miss the diversity of population and underestimated social inequalities. So it is not simple, and I don't have the intention to finish the discussion today. I just would like to, to call attention to, to this. Next, please. Here we have uh, some uh, the, the distribution data about Brazilian population according to color race. And according to data from the National Household Sample Survey, PNADI, PNIDI is a survey conducted annually by BGM, BDE, and it investigates several characteristics and indicators of Brazilian population. So in 2019, almost 47% of Brazilians declared themselves as pardo, 42.7 as white, 9.4 as black, and 1.1 as yellow or indigenous. <coughs> Mari, please next. Thank you. Um, this chart shows some results from PNADI about social inequalities indicators according to color race in Brazil. Uh, if I have to do the one observation that black and pardo uh, are present commonly in Brazil in aggregate form uh, as there is no, uh, uh, in English form as Negro, they, uh, it's properly called Negro to refer to the Brazilian population of African ancestry as a result of social movement of Negro population. And there is no translation for, for um, the word Negro to, to word Negro to English too. So uh, in 2018, uh, there were 47% of black opardos in informal jobs. 30% of black, black opardos occupied a manager position, while almost 70% 70, 70 of whites occupied a manager position. 32% of black opardos were in extreme poverty, which is living on less than $5.25 per day, according to the parameter of the World Bank. <coughs> Only 24 of federal deputies were black or pardo. And finally, the homicide rates among black or pardo was 43 per 100,000 inhabitants in 2017. Next, please. Uh, this slide, uh, we have two news about color race variable in official records of COVID-19 information systems. Uh, why? Currently, Brazil has two 
national information systems to notify and report COVID-19 suspected or confirmed case. One, one system is to report mute COVID-19 cases. In the beginning of the pandemic, it was HEDCAP. Currently, it is a SUS notifica. Other system to report severe COVID-19 a case of hospitalization and deaths, the CBEP grip. And because this becoming a new in Brazil, because in the beginning the, in the, of the pandemic, tolerance variable was not included in handicap, and in CBEP grip, there was the tolerance variable, but the registration was not mandatory. So in the first three months of COVID-19 pandemic in Brazil, there was no good and enough data, enough data record to analyze the distribution of COVID-19 cases according to color race, especially among huge cases. After so much pressure from civil society and uh, judicial decision, color race was included in the new system of huge cases, ESUS, and it becomes mandatory in the CBEP group. Many scientists in Brazil have discussed if this scenario could represent a kind of institutional hazard. Next, please. Um, here are, there are some data from severe acute respiratory syndrome according to color Hayes, until September 19 uh, from CVAP grip. So uh, until September 19, there were one, over 300,000 confirmed cases of severe acute respiratory syndrome of hospitalization. And among them, black and powder together represent 38% of the case. I would like to draw attention that 26 of records were missing value or marked as ignored. And moreover, until September 19, there were over 100,000 <coughs> deaths and black and power together correspond to 42% of those deaths. Again, 10%, again, 10 of records were missing value or marked as ignored. So Brazil has a, has a great challenge to surpass social and health inequities among the black and poor Brazilian population. Next, please. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Toledo. That was incredibly enlightening. And I think those of us who have been following COVID-19 and uh, oh, all of us are affected by it, but in the United States, in terms of uh, individuals disproportionately impacted, many of the same issues have been, uh, have, have been found in the US and in our region and San Diego as well. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Carolina Caldinho. Dr. Caldinho is a postdoctoral research fellow at Getulio Vargas Foundation in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, Dr. Caldinho is a researcher in epidemiology of infectious diseases and drug use. She has been a collaborator in co-PI in studies with hard to reach and, very, and highly stigmatized populations, such as individuals with substance use disorders and transgender women. Dr. Caldinho has also coordinated, co-coordinated large multi-city studies with hard to reach populations. And she is a talented biologist and researcher by training. Dr. Caldinho will discuss findings from the Brazilian national surveys that impact Brazil's most underserved communities and the interface between substance use and race. She will discuss results from the National Survey on Crack Cocaine Use and results from the third National Survey of Drug Use by the Brazilian population. It is a privilege to introduce Dr. Caltinho. Thank you, Mari. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mari, can you put my presentation too? Absolutely, for sure. Thanks. Uh,
So at first, I would like to thank you, Maria Luisa, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here talking about substance use in Brazil. I prepared a short version about the main results from, from the last Brazilian National Survey on Substance Use. So let's start. Uh, next, please. Uh, in the first place, I will talk about the official information about substance use that we have here in Brazil. Next, please. Uh, about the research agenda, we don't have the regularity. The data we have today in 2020 is outdated. In the past, we had some surveys about population in context, such as high school students, children and adolescents living on the streets and college students, but those surveys don't have any regularity. The last one was the National Survey on Crack Cocaine, dated from 2014. This survey was the first to adopt a sample representative of the whole country, and I will show some uh, of its results in a few minutes. But as Next, please. As far as the general population is concerned, we had only three surveys, also with no regularity. The first two surveys had adopted a sample that included only the 107th biggest municipality in our country. The last one that took place in 2015 was the first one with a national representative sample. Uh, we went to, to uh, 351 municipalities and interviewed around 16,000 respondents. Next, please. Uh, reg regarding our he health service, we don't have a national information system that collects the information about health care in mental health or substance use. So, uh, or when there is some information system, they are not connected. Furthermore, in the last years, the research funding is decreasing, which led most studies about substance use to adopt clinical samples or local ethnographic studies. Because of that, our monitoring capacity is very poor. We don't have sufficient data to know about the healthcare, specialized or not, provide to people who use substance in Brazil. Next, please. Uh, next. And that's why I will present uh, results from the last survey on substance use that had national representative samples, even though they are not as up to date as we would like. So I will present the results from the third national survey on drug use by Brazilian population that was coordinated by Francisco Bastos from Fiocruz, by me and other Brazilian researchers. It was a household survey, and we interviewed persons aged from 12 to 65 years old all over the country. The majority of respondents declared themselves as pardo or, or black, 54%. 44% declared themselves as white, and around 1% as yellow, Asian, or indigenous. Next, please. Uh, in relation to substance use, the prevalence of tobacco consumption in the previous 12 months in the Brazilian population was 17%. Of these, 42% were white, and around 60% were black or pardo. Uh, Concern the prevalence of alcohol consumption was 43%, just a little more than a half of those were in black or pardo. Next, please. Concerning the use of marijuana, the total prevalence age consumption in the Brazilian population was 2.5%. Of these, almost 48% were white, which is very similar to the stratification for color, race, 
found for tobacco and alcohol. However, the prevalent rate for the smokable crack cocaine and cocaine were lower than that found for the other substance. For the Brazilian population, the prevalent rate was 0.3% for crack cocaine and 0.9% for cocaine. When we stratify for color rate, the prevalent rate presents a similar pattern with around 70% black or pardo for these two substances. Next, please. Uh, regarding the crack cocaine prevalence, we just we have we must remember that this survey was a household one, and these results must be interpreted together with the results found in the National Survey of crack, on Crack Cocaine, which I will present now. So no, so I will show you some results from the National Survey on Crack Cocaine. Each was a survey that interviewed around 7,000 people, and the respondents were individuals aged 18 years old or more who had used crack cocaine and similar for at least 25 days in the previous six months, in pipe scans or other similar devices in open drug scene. 25 days in previous six months means they use it, uh, they use it like once a week or on average. The, re the respondents were also tested for HIV, hepatitis C, and tuberculosis. In this survey, around 80% of the respondents declared themselves as non-white. Next, please. Uh, when we asked about their living conditions during the previous 30 days, we found out that a substantial proportion of the users were living on the street, around 39%. This number shows that a meaningful proportion of people who smoke crack cocaine in open scenes were not in houses, so they cannot be assessed by a household survey. These results indicate that we have to assess the prevalence rate for crack cocaine uses from household surveys with caution. And it also indicates that for a smokable crack cocaine, we must take the results from these two surveys that I have presented as complementary findings. Next, please. As to infectious disease, the prevalence age for HIV was 5% and for HIV was 2.6%. Both HIV and HIV infection age are of concern since they have, since they were considerably higher than among the general population. Next, please. We also asked the interviewee about their desire to engage in some drug addiction treatment, and almost eight percent reported they desired to do so. When asked about which treatment they would desire. The user reported they would like to be provided with health service and social care facilities that gave them access to meals, bathing, clothing, and other services like that. Next, please. And last but not least, an important consideration to bring here in relation between is the relation between substance use and criminal justice in Brazil. We have in Brazil a correctional population of around 750,000 people and we have information about race color for 86% of them. The proportion of black people in jail is significantly higher than the proportion of black people in the Brazilian population. Additionally, uh, when we look for the criminal typification distribution, we can see that more than a half is related to the drug crime. I know it's, that this topic is so much deeper than this, but I will finish here so we can talk later. Thank you. Fantastic. Muito obrigada. Uh, this is a beautiful complementarity. That, that we are, are hearing today. 
And uh, we have a, a, a wonderful treat, I would say a, a privilege to have a fourth speaker that I will invite and we will have a, a little bit of a, um, a, 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 way, a special way of presenting since we weren't able to get simultaneous translation. Uh, this will be an opportunity to listen to, well, let me introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Um, Daniel Sousa, Daniel Benvindel. We're so honored to have you with us. And uh, I'd like to give a little bit of background that uh, I have learned about, about your important work with, with, the, with the community. So uh, Mr. Daniel Sousa is a colleague with several years of working in community settings, particularly in the community of Manguinhos. And uh, Manguinhos is a community, an underserved community located in uh, the north of Rio. And uh, Mr. Sousa is a community advocate, and he specializes in harm reduction to improve the health of individuals who uh, uh, use substances and who are disproportionately affected by the problems associated with substance use. He is a field worker and a member of a street outreach team in Manguinhos. He will, uh, Mr. Sousa will provide us with his firsthand experience and his observations of racism in a community context, and this will help round out the uh, the panel that we've had this morning. So I would like to welcome Mr. Sousa, and uh, I think that, uh, will Dr. Toledo be reading as well? Yes, yes. We awesome. should have a, a simultaneous translation, but the, the translator uh, can't to do it with us, so I will read the Daniel test uh, presentation. Thank you, Daniel, for allowing me to, to do this. Um, it's, um, I say, um, slavery will remain for a long time as a nation feature of Brazil. This is the most famous phrase in the book of my formation by Brazilian abolitionist Joaquim Nabucco. This book was written in the end of 19th century. Only those who feel racist in their skin know what it is like to be looked at with prejudice. That is something that is in the eyes of those who suffer the situation. This explainable look is felt and it hurts these things are difficult to talk about. Regarding human vulnerability, we, we understand that people who abuse alcohol, drugs, and people who live on the streets <coughs> have reaction in, inherent to entire process of marginalization and inferiorization to which they are subject. As a result, to a spontaneous search or even with the support of technicians for help or assistance services, in many cases, a laborious process, which arises especially with the elaboration and improvement of relations between workers and users. <coughs> in that moment, in a technically oriented and instrumentalized way, workers can depend the bond and then consolidate their work. This tool, the bond, unlike it, the technology, technology that support the hegemonic model of care, <coughs> should not be something hard and almost, almost never established immediately, require time, insistence, reflection, team discussion, and disposition. The technical depending of this case has an intrinsic relationship with the streaming of the bond, producing care and education for autonomy. A reflection to be made are the prejudice suffered by the black population through an existence, especially in Brazil, where the black has always been seen as a minor figure, despicable, disqualified and invisible. The various types of violence suffered and the marginalization of Blacks 
since the year zero of Brazil, which is straining by laws protecting the dominant elite where it segregates the less favored classes of society, creating structural racism in Brazilian society. The, the open drug scene called Capolanges in Portuguese, have mostly blacks and browns. Consultation offices on the streets, outdoor teams on the street, and of the street have, over time, played a fundamental role of bonding and monitoring, producing life potential. Therefore, the, the affections are created for deep encounters without superficiality encounters that often serve as a dangerous therapy for the soul. <coughs> I listed daily to fragments of life histories of those who care opportunity in their biotype, the black skin sold sheep subdued. Being black in Brazil is a recurring reason for pol police suspicions while the body black we live uh, in a constant state of alert. We have to, to increasingly open up racism, mainly chauvinism, transphobia, and any other type of prejudice as a construction of break paradigms. Affirm every day that black lives matter, that lives matter. Where we step will never be the same because what we are doing is struggle. Maria de Franco, what we are doing is a revolution. Carolina Maria de Jesus, where we are alive. Elia Garcia, we are in this assist country by resistance. Abudias do Nascimento and others. And we have to continue to resist Conceição Evaristo because it is our race to resist. Zumbi dos Palmares. It is. I finished, Mari. Obrigada. Thank you. Muito obrigada, Lidiane. Uh, Daniel, we are honored and uh, um, um privilege to have your uh, uh, presence and perspectives with us to illuminate the individuals who have given their lives to the, to the struggle uh, to, to bring attention to the racism. And so I'm, I'm very grateful, I think on behalf of everyone, the, the, um, the way that you have allowed us to understand and uh, be, become maybe part of this movement to take oppression uh, away. And we're, we're working in that same spirit in the United States. So, muito obrigada. The, those are very profound words that, uh, that were translated and provided by Dr. Toledo. Thank you. So, esteemed colleagues, we have uh, had now the opportunity to listen to uh, some extraordinary presentations to help us. Uh, Dr. Bastos helped us frame, frame the, the issue of, of, of uh, racism in its historic context and its context in Brazil. So how we measure, uh, who we measure. And uh, Dr. Toledo provided us with a very, I think, insightful way of understanding how measurement has happened in both Brazil and the United States, measurement of race, ethnicity, and, and when are we measuring and who gets measured, and, and understanding the implications of measurement in epidemiological studies, and who counts and who is not. And then uh, Dr. Caldinho provided us with some very important complementary insights about the burden of substance use, crack cocaine, from the surveys that are available and the disproportionate burden of crack cocaine on the uh, African Pardo community. 
in Brazil. And our final presenter, uh, Mr. Daniel de Sousa, who has uh, enlightened us into the, 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 the current struggle against um, the phobias and, and the violence that is, uh, has been part of the, this process of, of bringing to life acknowledgement of the racism that is living right now in Brazil. So we have had this, uh, beautiful, uh, pre these beautiful presentations that open our eyes. And I'd like to take a few questions I know that, uh, so I have some fantastic students who are with us today and I'd like to, I'll, I'll try and get to some questions from everyone. Um, I would like to, perhaps I'll ask a question that was posed by Mr. Wayne Kepner. Uh, the question is for Dr. Cautinho uh, regarding injection cocaine in Brazil and uh, why uh, the low prevalence of injection cocaine and whether there's any in reasons that we might better understand that. Thank you. Uh, I think Shifu can answer that better than me, but uh, the results we, that I show here were, were about uh, not injectable cocaine, were referring to I forgot the word. She could can help me. <laughs> uh, aspirada. Inhaled. I forgot the word. Snorted. 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 Yeah. Inhaled. Yeah. 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 Inhaled. <laughs> cocaine. Uh, about the injected cocaine, we had a lower prevalence, and in, in the past we we had some significant prevalence in some specific municipalities and, and spaces, but in the 90s, when the crack came, uh, the majority of the users, substance users, were changing their partner and changing to crack cocaine, a smokable crack cocaine, because it's much cheaper. I think she could want yeah, to talk. I I think it's a combination of several factors. Um, uh, we are far from fully explaining what happened, but uh, basically we had a uh, strong and fast spread of HIV and hepatitis C uh, among injection drug users in the 80s, late, especially in the late 80s and the early 90s. And in that period, the um, one factor is that the uh, AIDS program was very active and very well integrated with the social society. And they disseminated very important campaigns, both target to the general audience, but also to specific groups. and the, campaigns uh, <clears throat> targeting injection drug users were very well developed and we, we had a um, uh, strong work of outreach workers. The founding fathers of what Daniel is currently doing. So I, I think that um, this is part of the explanation. The second explanation is that um, the market has changed substantially over the years and basically what happened in the US in the early 80s happened in Brazil one decade later uh, with the boom of crack cocaine because crack cocaine is basically a very decentralized network so um, it's a network that uh, combine two different characteristics. One of them is that it's impossible to track uh, the so-called precursors you, because this was a very successful strategy by uh, the federal police in Brazil to track 
uh, people who uh, were buying um, large amount of um, substance that should be used to produce powder cocaine. And what, uh, so with crack cocaine, basically you can uh, have crack cocaine in your kitchen. Is a decentralized production network and also a decentralized distribution network. So if someone is arrested with uh, four or five stones in his or her pocket, the losses in, in terms of the drug dealers is uh, negligible. Is very different from large amount of powder cocaine that costs much higher, and they are basically distributed in what we call Boca de Fumo or hot spots, heavily guarded, and under strict surveillance uh, the whole time. Another issue is that um, the um, the networks in terms of distribution change a lot over time and there is a globalization of, of the routes basically because the old routes have been under big pressure so new routes have been opened and Brazil is no longer the key relay like uh, some years ago. Um, so the harbor of Rio and Santos, the two main harbors of Brazil, are no longer the key export uh, sources in terms of Europe, for instance, uh, in terms of uh, distribution of powder cocaine. So a uh, larger fraction of cocaine remain in the country, but no longer as powder cocaine, but basically as coca paste. And coca paste uh, is the origin of crack cocaine. So with all these changes, the powder cocaine became very impure in Brazil, mixed with several different contaminants. And I heard myself talking with people that uh, there is a big, big risk to inject this very dirty uh, contaminated cocaine after mixing with water because it, it causes uh, thrombosis, uh, problem in the veins. So um, despite the fact that crack cocaine is very harmful, um, it's less harmful in the short term, of course, compared to injecting very dirty, diluted powder cocaine. So it's a, I think it's a combination of several factors, but even in Southern Brazil, where the influence of European population um, is very strong, especially the massive immigration uh, of uh, Germans and Italians in the beginning of the 20th century and now their um, grandchildren. Even in, in these areas uh, with a long-term tradition of injecting uh, not only cocaine but uh, homemade opioids, not heroin, that's very, very expensive in Brazil. Even in the South now, the injection drug use is uh, on decline. So it's a decline all over the country. It's a, it's a long story, but I try to, to make it more or less short. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bastos. That was, that was very insightful and very um, important to understand also uh, the trends that you're mentioning and uh, how uh, the the inhaled the powder cocaine or the, the crack cocaine uh, will make the different health issues different as well. So um, I would like to invite. We have a, a participant, a colleague, uh, Abner Francisco Sotenos. Uh, would you like to present your question? 
or would you like me to read it? Okay. Dr. Sotenos, I'm happy to read the, the question that you've raised at, at one of the beginning. Uh, and please feel free to contribute if you, if you want to elaborate. So uh, this question from Dr. Sotenos is, or Mr. Sotenos, I'm not sure, uh, for Dr. Toledo. Since the notions of race and ethnicity in Brazil and the US are different, how do you analyze influences that social and cultural movements have on the black population of one country with another? And he, uh, uh, this colleague, uh, appreciates your presentation. You're, uh, you're muted. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, it's, it's a very complex question. Um, uh, despite uh, that concept in both cultures are different differences. I think the, the problem is the same in everyday lives. So I think it, many people can see each other under the problems. Um, for example, as Danielle said, black, black people more than white people are always under suspicion about to, to commit uh, street crimes as robbery and shotgun. So I think that the thing that connects two to movements is the, the problems, the, the, the same problems that happen in the US and here. Discrimination, stigma, uh, the invisibility, the opportunity. So I think it's, it is a way. Chico can help me too if he, he can. Compliment. Uh, um, in, in what sense, Liliane? Just to. Uh, why, uh, uh, considering that the United States and Brazil have two different concepts of racism and ethnicity, but uh -huh. they, they have uh, the, the same movement to Black Lives Matter and we need more <coughs> inclusive politics, affirmative politics. <coughs> why uh -huh. they. What, what, join this, this two population to, to fight against it. Yeah, yeah. Fight against discrimination, I, to fight against. Yeah, <coughs> I, I, I want to move back to history. Uh, I, I like history very much. And so I understand Brazil as uh, US upside down. Uh, so, uh, in the U.S., you have a civil war between um, the agrarian South in that period against the industrialized North in that period. And in Brazil, we had just uh, the opposite. Uh, we had the uh, agrarian Northeast, uh, um, which is the region described and studied by Gilberto Freire and other classic uh, writers. Um, and, and we didn't have a civil war. So basically the end of slavery was a movement um, that resulted from a combination of uh, pressures from, especially from England, uh, in terms of the um, uh, slave trade, trading routes across the Atlantic Ocean, and, but also a movement of the Brazilian elites, some of them uh, curiously, um, elites from African Brazilian uh, descent, like Machado de Assis, our greatest writer, but also from Joaquim Nabucco. What Joaquim Nabucco mentioned uh, in Daniel's presentation, wrote the most influent book in the trans transition from the empire to republic. And Joaquim Nabucco belonged to one of the most rich families in the whole country. He was a landlord uh, in 
in the northeast. His father was the first minister of the emperor, and he was a very, very important diplomat himself, uh, serving both in Paris and also in Washington. He was the first Brazilian ambassador in the US. And he wrote the first very strong book against uh, slavery. So for, I think for years, uh, the discussion and the movement uh, were basically a conflict inside the intellectual elite like uh, Joaquin Nabucco, uh, anti-slavery uh, pioneer, and other very, very conservative leaderships, uh, both in the in empire and in, in the beginning of the republic. And only very uh, much, much later, uh, it became um, a social movement in the sense of the US. We, we didn't have the social movement compared, for instance, with uh, what has been done by Martin Luther King. There, this is absent in Brazil. We had no war, we had no old movement. Basically, we had the debate inside the political and intellectual elites. And maybe from the 70s on, Yes, we, we, we began to have a series of, and especially in the 80s, a series of movements more or less similar to the social movements in the US, like the uh, gay movement, the um, uh, black movement. And so we have some uh, precursors like Abdias Nascimento, also mentioned by Daniel. I, I, I had the pleasure to, to meet him several times in my life. He was married to an American scholar, a very nice woman. And Abdias founded what he called the Black Theater in Brazil. The first uh, theater incorporating black um, actors. This is unbelievable in Brazil because ha more than half of the society uh, is composed by blacks. But before Abdias Nascimento, before Ruth de Souza, that is died a few years ago, uh, we had not a single black actor in our theater and in our cinema just after several years. Of course, we had in our popular music. Our popular music has a very strong uh, black root, very similar to what happened in the US with blues and jazz, but um, not in the um, leisure activities linked to the aff affluent classes. So basically we have a delay, but now I think we have a double movement uh, both at the level of the political elites and the intellectuals, but also in the very base of the society that is mostly composed by people with uh, close uh, Afro-Brazilian uh, link. I, as, I, as I said before, all of us have uh, Afro-American link, but uh, I, I'm, I'm saying about people who is fathers or grand, grandfathers, mothers, grandmothers, so it's something closer to our uh, generation. Thank you I hope I much. could, I could uh, clarify a little bit. Very much, thank you. And, and the historical context I think allows us to appreciate even better where we are. I wanted to bring in uh, a note from Dr. Toledo that she mentioned Daniel would like to discuss about women in the open drug scenes. And I, I do believe that we should uh, allow uh, uh, Mr. De Sousa, and I don't know if uh, we will translate or interpret for you. How would you, how shall we do this? So the, the, the topic that we uh, would like to bring into this conversation is about women and the open drug scene.
Li Jani, do you know if uh, Daniel can join us? Uh, Daniel, você pode abrir o microfone e começar a falar? Oi, tá ouvindo? Sim, agora sim, beleza. Agora sim. <risos> então, eu tava na dúvida é, se era para falar, porque eu não falo nada de inglês, desculpe. Mas, assim, falar um pouco sobre a questão da mulher na cena. É sempre difícil, sempre mais difícil ser estruturalmente mulher. Acho que é assim no mundo, porque acho que a questão da, da mulher né, é, é algo que no mundo né, já vem como sempre subjugada né, em várias civilizações. Então, ser mulher também nesses espaços de uso, nesses espaços em, em que elas são o tempo todo subjugadas, é com certeza mais difícil do que ser homem, por, até mesmo na própria violência, elas escolhem estar com um parceiro em que pratique só uma violência para ela ter uma certa proteção de não ser violentada por várias, várias pessoas. Então, ela sempre tem uma pessoa que a protege, mas, ao mesmo tempo, também é uma relação muito violenta. É, quando a gente fala de uso de drogas dentro dessas cenas de uso para a população que vive na rua ou faz esse uso muito abusivo, é, em sua grande maioria, está na rua, é, essas violências vêm desde do, né, da cor da pele, né, que a grande maioria são pessoas que aqui no Brasil a gente fala pretas e pardas. Né, e e, e esse, essas questões da mulher na rua é sempre para gente que trabalha com diretamente com a população algo que nos aflige muito porque a gente tenta trabalhar a partir de um de um vínculo e de um de um de uma garantia de direitos né em que o estado possa proteger mas a gente também entende que as relações vividas é, paralelamente à sociedade né é, são são questões é, de, um, de uma questão cultural deles, né, de vida, né, de uma vida que aqui a gente chama de uma vida de periferia que é diferente é, de quem vive uma vida que não está dentro da periferia, né? Então a mulher com certeza também sofre, né? Se, dentro, se mesmo fora da periferia ser mulher já é algo muito difícil, né? Estruturalmente falando, nas, nas que, colocando essas questões machistas, né? Nós vivemos num, numa sociedade totalmente patriarcal. É, chegando na cena também, isso é uma representação da vida, porque estar na rua, estar nessas cenas, não é um lugar muito fora do nosso mundo, mas existe leis e questões que são culturais que são bem diferentes da que a gente vive é, costumeiramente, né? Sim, sim. Então, é bem complicado. Muito obrigada, Daniel. É, eu invito, assim, muito, muito aplauso, aplauso. É, Thank you. Ma, sim, sim. <laughs> a você. É, I would like to maybe ask if perhaps Lidiana can give us a very brief summary of the main topics that uh, Daniel brought to light about the, the position of the, and I can start a little bit and ask for you to please add, Uh, the position of the black woman uh, in the situation of, of, of uh, open use and, and, and in the streets, uh, uh, individuals who, uh, black women, have uh, many violence, uh, different types of violence uh, that are, uh, they're subjected to in addition to uh, the, the racism. And uh, the, Daniel, our colleague, was calling attention to the different types of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, violence that uh, these women receive and the need to be able to, uh, to support them through the type of street outreach and work that our colleagues uh, have uh, taken. So I'd like to ask if there's, a, Lijani, perhaps a little bit more? Did I miss something? So Mary, I think you, you talk about everything that Danielle said. Uh, I think is the situation is, is a deep social exclusion, uh, especially when they, these humans don't have 
good access to service and good as uh, and basic things of life as food, as house, and he and she they 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 need to to engage in sex training, for example. So I think is is this is the, the way why we 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 observe in our searches. Thank you. Muito obrigada. Uh, so what I'd like to next do is uh, offer the opportunity for one of our students to ask a question. Uh, Dania, I know that you had a question from earlier and uh, if you would like to ask it in person, I would give you that opportunity or I can ask for you. Yes, I can ask it. Thank you. Um, it was actually for uh, Dr. Um, Toledo. Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Um, you mentioned how um, like the, the perception of race differs across like regions of Brazil. So if you're in one place, you can perceive yourself as specific race and in another it differs. How does that impact uh, research on like country level? And like, how do you manage that if you're doing research uh, related to race? Okay, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, we have a golden, um, a pre-established uh, categories and question that is from a BGA. So all of epidemiologic uh, needs to use that. But some researchers said that the five categories, categories is not enough to represent uh, the diversity of Brazil. So there is a big, big, big debate here. Uh, what we should to do? We need to open questions and keep disclosing questions. And some scientists uh, think about to do a, as a different, different. I think it's a big, big, a big concern to the population. How population can uh, think is that is that this this question should be applied in the studies. And, uh, and, and but there is a lot of problems if you you if you use the open question uh, maybe a person as I I identify myself as pardo but some some persons some per people as identify self as moreno black moreno uh, little moreno coffee with milk so this this is a, a big diversity so it's not a, a easy question and not an easy answer to give to you maybe she could can help me with this yeah, I, I think there, there are two main problems. Uh, one is that um, uh, we have a long, long time series in terms of uh, the major census in Brazil. Uh, since the 90s, the, the, the 19th century, not the 19th, 19th century, uh, using the same categories. And these categories are very bad. Uh, because they basically classify everybody according to what they call color. So the colors are, in a literal translation, are white, uh, brown, black, yellow, and more recently they, they included Indian. So it's, it's a very bad classification uh, because some words have no meaning, like yellow. Yellow is a uh, is good for a banana, but not for a person. So, but uh, it's not easy to change because, um, as Lijani mentioned, you uh, I believe we we should have a transition period because we cannot um, just ignore uh, more than 100 uh, century of census every 10 years. The, the, the census of this year was postponed to next year because of COVID, but uh, we have a long tradition. But at the same time, we need to, to improve the category. So I think the best solution uh, of course, I'm not the director of IBGE, so 
is uh, I cannot uh, make the change myself, but I think the best solution is to to keep the original categories, and, but then uh, include additional questions and at least in the, uh, because our census has two components, one short questionnaire that's applied to every single Brazilian uh, and uh, a, a, a larger version that's applied to a uh, representative probability sample of Brazilian. So maybe in the larger questionnaire, we could cross compare the original categories and, and with mm -hmm. better categories. Uh, maybe not in the sense because it would be very costly, but we need, we need to change but um, unfortunately, we need also to keep at least in the next census some uh, cross comparison with the former ones because um, we cannot throw the baby together with the, the, the water uh, all, all, all uh, in the garbage can. Uh, so it's complicated, but uh, we need to improve. It's, it's a very, very old uh, classification, outdated and full of prejudice. Thank you, Dr. Bastos. We, we have some of the same issues in the United States and, and then with the, there's problems with political uh, influencing the questions, which complicates matters even further for research. I'd like to invite uh, uh, one of our other students, Nate Fox. Uh, Nate, would you like to ask your question? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, just a general question to any of our uh, great presenters today, is just um, about international collaboration. Uh, what are the biggest barriers, um, like today we've experienced language, and um, what are the biggest barriers you've experienced to international collaboration, and what are the best practices for addressing those? Uh, we have a, uh, a long tradition of collaboration that started um, with the WHO multi-city studies um, launched when I began my career. Unfortunately, nowadays, uh, WHO is no longer uh, uh, able to coordinate uh, large studies basically because they lack the fund and also because uh, as you know there are conflicts between, between the countries and WHO and inside WHO so uh, my, my personal experience with WHO and the Pan American Health Organization was very very good very instructive I learned a lot our partners uh, were two senior American researchers that maybe you know. One is Sam Friedman, uh, others Don Dejalet from both from New York. They, I learned a lot with them from them, and so now. Um, I'm not longer seeing collaborations under the umbrella of WHO, but uh, I think we can try to do our best to uh, improve the collaborations with uh, specific institutions as we are currently doing with uh, MARI and other people from SDSU and other universities. And I think such collaborations are very, all, always very, very fruitful because we learn a lot from each other and uh, we also learn to look um, at a given situation from different perspectives. And I must confess to you that uh, I live part of my life uh, abroad and uh, when I was alone, for instance, in Providence, very cold for me, I was feeling like uh, uh, frozen uh, ping, penguin or um, uh, cub of ice. I, 
I was thinking about my country and how he, it is different and how I should uh, better study uh, my country. So I think we learn both exchanging ideas with other people and also looking at our, our own settings from uh, far away. Uh, because when we are in, inside a given setting, we are embedded in, 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 in this context. So it's difficult to, to see from, from far away. And so I learn a lot when I, I live for a while in, in different countries like US and UK. And so I think co uh, international cooperation is key for everyone. Uh, for, for you who are there and for us, we're here. I hope this epidemic could be curbed and so the international traveling could be resumed fully, fully and so you can, you can interact in person, not only via uh, the internet. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bastos. That is, that is my wish as well, for us to be able to be uh, in person and, and continue learning from each other. I wanted to invite uh, Raul Pejarano. Raul is one of uh, another of our students that have, uh, are in the uh, uh, global research methods class that I teach. And Raul, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Suniga. So this question is for Dr. Coutinho. Um, in 2006, a new drug law was passed in Brazil with the object, objective of separating the figure of the drug user from that of the drug trafficker. How does this law work in practice and how do racism and social exclusion intervene in the daily functioning of this law? Thank you. Uh, I, will, I will join the answers. The, the previous question and this question, my biggest barrier is the language. I can read, I can, I can write in English, but I have too many difficult to talk in English yet. And in Brazil, we have we have a few opportunities to study outside Brazil, so it's not easy studying English. We have to to work, and we don't have time to study. <laughs> but uh, I'm doing my best. And I will let this question to Shiku because I don't have enough English to respond to you properly. <laughs> so I think he he's answered better than me, much better than me. I'm sorry. No, okay. thank you. So how, uh, let me explain. We had uh, a major change uh, in the legislation in 2006. But uh, unfortunately, the legislation is very inaccurate in terms of defining who is who. Who is the people who have a uh, harmful habit of using drug dependent people, for instance, and who are the dealers? We have no clear criteria to distinguish uh, one person from another person. There are criteria that can be used. And for instance, in Portugal, they have what they call, um, I don't know how to translate into English, maybe uh, combined courts or something like this. Uh, in Portugal, they have groups uh, with uh, someone from justice, from someone from social uh, workers, uh, someone from psychology, some, someone from uh, representing uh, the state that um, so the legislative or the Congress or, or other body and, and, and such <clears throat> bodies, they work together. Of course, they are not perfect. Uh, humans are not perfect. So, but it's better to listen to four or five different opinions and uh, then to define who is who. And in Portugal, for instance, um, people who use drugs, they are not arrested. Um, 
but uh, the big dealers, yes, they may be arrested. And what happens in Brazil is that uh, basically all legal processes are initiated by the police. What is a big mistake? Because legal process should be initiated by a prosecutor or a judge. And now we have what is called, um, there is no translation in, in, in English because there is no such uh, uh, category in English, but now they are trying to uh, put a judge or other member of, formal member of the justice uh, in the first 48 hours after the arrest arrestment of anybody by the police. But in most places, it doesn't function. And so the process are initiated by, by the police and several months or sometimes years later, um, it will be appreciated by a formal court. Uh, this is a big mistake because uh, the the policemen, they, they have no background even in the proper understanding of the law. The law is not uh, the best of the world, but at least with some degree of accuracy, it could be better. So uh, basically when you um, just have a cop to decide if someone is a user or a dealer, things become very confusing because the law says that the cop should consider the context. So if you live in a favela, in a slum, or if you live in the outskirts, as mentioned by uh, Marcelo, if you are black, if you are poor, if you have a low educational level, so you cannot communicate uh, using uh, the grammatically correct Portuguese. So much probably you, you'll be arrested as a dealer. Uh, even if you present very clear symptoms that uh, if you use, for instance, DSM or ICD would characterize you uh, as a drug dependent pe person. But the cops don't know anything about DSM uh, or ICD or any psychological or social dimension. They just want to arrest someone who is in a, in a place where drug is being sold. It, it doesn't matter if this person has just one uh, stone inside his pocket. Uh, if he's poor, black, if he cannot uh, debate uh, his situation, he will be arrested. And months and months and months later, uh, this, this person will go to a court. So this is the main reason that uh, despite the more or less half and half fractions of white people and non-white people to simplify, uh, the proportion of people inside the, the prison system in Brazil is over 70%. So there is an uh, over um, with, uh, inclusion of people of color and people of all minorities in, in our prison system. This is not different from what happens in the US, but I think for different reasons. Um, I think in the US, this is my, my perception, is that uh, the, the lack of proportion, of course, is linked to racism, racism, but of course is linked also to the harsh penalties applied to crack cocaine in the early 80s. And in Brazil, it's not a matter of what is the drug. Um, even for cannabis, the proportion of uh, black people or other minorities is much, much higher than their proportion in the general population. So 
uh, race is just one factor. Uh, other factors are, for instance, gender, uh, uh, inequality. Other uh, factor is poverty. Other factor is the fact that people have no lawyers. And when you have a private lawyer, of course, you can uh, put some pressure on the police to to go to a court, but when you are waiting for a public uh, defender, I don't know in the US how it functions, but in Brazil, it's very, very slow because we have a small body of uh, public uh, free of any charge defenders and a lot of people being arrested every single day. So I think the only solution is this initiative that is functioning in some places to uh, oblige people to include a uh, judge in the first 48 hours after detention is the only way to have a modicum of justice. If, if this doesn't happen, we'll continue discriminating against uh, all people who are poor and less educated and who live in favelas sometimes just because they live in favelas. Uh, but to live in a favela is, is not a crime. For, to live in a favela is a matter of poverty. They, they live because they cannot live in, in places where uh, rentals are very expensive and it's impossible to buy a house. So basically, this is my, my explanation. Thank you Thank very you. much. Dr. Bastos, that was a, a incredibly um, useful for us to understand uh, the same issues that are happening in other Latin American countries uh, when it has to do with um, how individuals are treated disproportionately uh, uh, mistreated by the police uh, and then adding to it the element of uh, decriminalization and, and policies that hopefully are supposed to mean something to bringing people to treatment instead of managing substance use as a, as a crime. So I'm very grateful that you've brought to light both of these issues that are, are intertwined. Thank you. I would like to invite if someone else would, would like to ask a question. I think we have time for one or two more questions. If you'd like to raise your hand or And I've tried to answer some things that uh, access issues that or questions that our colleagues have put in the chat. So uh, hopefully we can make that available. Uh, I would like to, I, I, I have one, uh, one question. Is um, what, this, this is a question for all of us who participate in the world of academics. Uh, and perhaps uh, we can have some discussion about this. What can we do as academics to call attention to institutional racism in academics, uh, in policies or processes? And so I'd like to open that up uh, as a possible question for others to, to think about. Mari, it's just an observation about this question. In Brazil, we have an official system when the researchers can write their curriculums. And in these systems, uh, there is no obligation to answer about your race or color. So we don't know how much researchers in Brazil we have how much black researchers, how much, how much further researchers we have in Brazil, because it's not an obligation to answer, to resist our color or race. So I, I, I think it is changing in, in, in the, I think in, in this year, but uh, it was not a, a mandatory to resist your color race. So it's impossible to measure how much uh, black and Pardo is in the academia, in the academic in Brazil, just to relate it. And the, thank you for, uh, for bringing this up because it is something that 
uh, we are making an effort, at least in, in some institutions in the United States, to track the success of underrepresented groups. Uh, so traditionally, underrepresented in the United States would be uh, persons of African heritage, Black persons, and uh, persons of Latino or Hispanic heritage. Uh, as, a, as communities of academics, we are very poorly present, represented in the research as, as researchers. And it is an opportunity by way of measurement to make the process more equal when you know who is applying for the grant proposals, who is proposing the courses uh, as a matter of metrics. So I think this is something that allows us to at least appreciate the depth of the problem. And, and it has helped, I think, in some way bring light to the inequity of representation. So thank you, Dr. Toledo. That was, uh, it's, it's, so, it's important for us to understand and, and share uh, each other's experiences and, and the, the systems in which we operate. Would, would anyone else like to, to make a comment? I welcome, uh, please uh, raise your hand or... Uh, I think Dania would like to read something. Ah, Dania. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Coutinho. You're better than I am with this. Uh, Dania, welcome. Please uh, feel free to ask your question. OK. Para frente. Mesmo que a cabeça diga não. Para frente. Para frente. Matar o mais um. Matar antes de ser morto. Por um lado, viver invisível. Por outro, as vantagens de ser invisível. Preto, culpado, preto, exterminado, com armas de calibre e caneta preta. Quero a liberdade de ser livre. Livremente andar sem ser notado. Ser notado como gente que anda livre. Forward, even if, even if the head says no. Forward, forward. They kill one more. Kill before you kill. On the one hand, living invisible. On the other hand, the advantages of being invisible. You to black, black exterminated, with guns and black pants. I want the freedom to be free. Freely walking without being noticed. Be noticed as people who are free. A cor da minha cabeça, a cor dos meus olhos, a cor do meu cabelo, a cor do meu medo. Ontem eu fui parado entre a avenida do lado de cá, de uma rua qualquer. Entrei no ônibus, alguém se levanta. Fui no mercado, alguém me seguiu. Deitei no banco da praça. Mandaram eu levantar. Voltei para casa. Mandaram eu parar. Yesterday I was stopped. Sorry. The color of my head, the color of my eyes, the color of my hair, the color of my feet. Yesterday I was stopped between the avenue on the side and some street. I got on the bus. Someone got up. I was at the market. Someone followed me. I lay on the bench in the square. They told me to get up. I came back home. I was told to stop. Levante os braços. Tá indo para onde? O que é que tu tá fazendo aqui? Abre as pernas, encosta na parede. Tu quer ficar aqui de... tu que fica dizendo aí que o Brasil tem jeito? Agora eu estou por aí. Por aqui não, olha para mim. Olha para minha frente. Não, não olha para trás. Tu matou? Tu roubou? Tu cheirou? Tu joga futebol? Tu tem pau grande? Tu samba? Quem disse que tu pode ir entrando assim? Quem te deixou entrar? Tu tem documento? Então prova. Entrou por cota. O que é que tu tá pensando agora? O que é que você está pensando agora? Raise your arms. Where are you going? What are you doing here? Spread your legs. Lean against the wall. Are you saying the Brazil has a way? I'm here because I can't go that way. Forward. Don't look back. Did you kill? Did you steal? Did you sneeze? Do you play football? Do you have a big dick? Do you samba? Who said you could go in like that? Who let you in? Do you have a document? So prove it. Did you enter by Costa? What are you thinking now? What are you thinking? Vidas pretas importam. Ai, respiro e volto a dizer. Vidas pretas importam sim. Black lives matter. Breathe. I say again. Black lives do matter. Thank you. Obrigadíssima. Obrigadíssima. Não tenho mais palavras. Obrigada, Nel. Daniel. 
Ah, no pienso, no tengo, acho que no hay otra palabra para terminar tan bello como las palabras que usted fala. Y también, obrigada a la persona, a persona que uh, interpretó. Muy obrigada. Obrigada, colega. So I'm, I'm giving gratitude. I can't think of a, a more wonderful way to uh, close the session. And I want to express my deepest gratitude. Obrigadísima a nuestros uh, panelistas, eh, Daniel de Sousa, Dr. Francisco Ignacio Bastos, Doctora Toledo, Lidiane Toledo, y Doctora Carolina Catinho. Together you have helped us create a platform of hope. You've helped us have a heightened awareness of where we've been and where we should be going. And I'm grateful for the opportunity for us to be inspired by your words, to make deliberate choices of what our next goals will be together. So thank you once again to our, all our panelists and to our supporters, to the uh, Center for Brazilian Studies. And I wish everyone a fantastic day and a very thoughtful and fantastic week. Thank you. Adeus, obrigada a todos. <laughs>